L. Brown. I'm a professor of history in the Department of History and Government here at Bowie State University. And welcome everybody to our program today. We have a wonderful program for you and we're so happy that you could join us. Um, we are working on a partnership with the African-American Firefighters Historical Society. And I'm getting a little feedback from my live streaming. <laughs> so my apologies. Um, however, uh, so we're working on a partnership with them. And one of the things that we are doing to um, further that partnership along is highlighting the Chapel Oaks Fire Department. And the Chapel Oaks Fire Department is a very historical fire department, not only in the state of Maryland, but I really believe in the country. Um, it was the first all black volunteer fire uh, station in the state of Maryland. And so our program today is going to talk about the founding of that department and its ongoing living legacy. Uh, the fire department will be celebrating its 75th anniversary this summer, and we hope to be a part of that as well. So I'm going to turn the program over to Dr. Roger Davidson, an associate professor of history here in the Department of History and Government at Bowie State University. Um, our panelists today are George Collins. He is the president and founder of the African American Firefighters uh, Historical Society. And also Ms. Tanya Gorham Barnes and her family um, has ties to the founding of the fire department. Um, and she will be representing the family and the history in that way. And hopefully we will be joined by uh, fire chief Jonathan Bolden, who continues to be a fire chief in, the, in Prince George's County and is the vice president of Chapel Oaks Fire Station. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Davidson. I'll interject every now and again. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'd good like afternoon. to, as we start off, uh, just uh, make the point that Chapel Oaks Fire Department, Volunteer Fire Department, is still active, is still open, though historical. It's located at 5544 Sheriff Road in Capitol Heights, Maryland. I plan on uh, driving by and checking it out, and I'm sure they would appreciate to, if you were to go and for those who are listening, drive by, check out a piece of history. I'd like to also welcome uh, those who are here with us to share this history, uh, Ms. Tanya Barnes, uh, Mr. George Collins, and hopefully later on, uh, Chief Bolden. Likewise, I'd like to uh, send out a hearty welcome to the president of Bowie State University, Dr. Uh, Aminita Bro, uh, the provost and academic officer, uh, Dr. Carl Goodman, the Dean of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Dean, uh, Dr. Uh, George Aqua, and the chairperson of uh, the Department of History and Government, uh, Dr. Dear uh, Robertson, as well as our faculty, students, alumni, and friends of Bowie who may be chiming in. Today, uh, in, in discussing this department, you know, we have the title, Making a Way Out of No Way, Making a Way Out of No Way. This ties into the theme of Black History Month, but also ties into a larger Black theme that we have, um, and that is there, that when African-Americans are presented with a situation, they don't have to wait for someone to bail them out, they create their own. And so in these times when either services are denied, uh, when services are, 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 are inferior, African-Americans find a way to create their own. And this, this, this historic fire department is part of that. So I'd like to start off with uh, either Mr. Collins or Ms. Barnes. Well, let me start off with uh, Ms. Barnes or Mrs. Barnes. Uh, what were your recollections uh, growing up in Prince George's County when we start to think of the atmosphere in which this fire department was created? What are your recollections about growing up in Prince George's County and uh, where did your family come from? Okay, uh, I grew up in Prince George's County in Fairmont Heights, Maryland. And my family came from um, Spotsylvania County, Virginia. And 
me see. They settled here. Um, my dad was, um, he was um, in the military and they moved to this area. And growing up in Prince George's County, um, I you know, grew up in Prince George's County in the late 50s. So I um, went to an all black elementary school and in our neighborhood, there were black owned businesses. Um, and when I went to junior high school, that was a black uh, junior high, um, Bethune Junior High School. And I attended Fairmont Heights High School, which was a black high school in the area. And there was a tight knit neighborhood. Everybody watched out for everybody. Um, and it was, um, I don't know. Do you need to pull something else out? No, 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 I mean, I, I was just gonna let you go with that. But uh, thinking on the atmosphere, so you had, you lived in a tight knit community. Mm -hmm. black businesses and black schools, but outside of that community in the larger Prince George's County area, what was it like? I mean, what were, were there any tensions? Did everyone get along? Was it, you know, even in the fifties at this time, somewhat segregated? Um, from talking and listening to my dad, there were tensions, you know, with the different fire departments, um, uh, you know, the white versus the black and um, and there was tensions with the police department also. They would come up to the Chapel Oaks Volunteer Fire Department. That was before my time, but they would um, pull some of the guys and take them to the um, police station on Addison Road and put them in a lineup just for no particular reason because just, of their color. Just for harassment. Yes. Mr. Collins, is there anything you could add to that? Uh, what no, were, just, were you, are you from Prince George's County and what was your life like? No, no I'm, in, I'm from Baltimore and I'm one of those uh, fortunate baby boomers that were born in the 60s and mm -hmm. uh, grew up in the 70s and benefited from all the work done from the individuals in the uh, 50s and 60s and that's why this giving back to make sure that the history is uh, known, that's, I feel, is my calling. So to identify the Gorm family and their sacrifice of uh, the Mr. and Mrs. Gorm's three oldest children, uh, who were five, two, and almost 11 months at the time, for, for that sacrifice to show that 75 year, years later, uh, institution is built, uh, I think that that needs to be highlighted. So just benefiting from the work that was done before I was born in 1961, uh, that's, that's how my interest is spots. Well, in, in looking at the, 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 you talked about the sacrifice and the atmosphere in which this fire department was created. And I just want to go come back to you, Ms. Barnes. Um, before we, before I even get into the founding of the department, one last thing on the on the atmosphere. And you were talking about the community and, and, and businesses. It sounds like vibrant businesses. What was the yeah. social economic life like? You know, in there. I mean, homeowners, renters, government workers, or uh, what, what? What was that like in, in your in your area? In the area were, where the fire okay. department from? They were all homeowners. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the folks were employed by the federal government. In fact, my dad was employed by the um, federal government. He was employed at the government printing office. Okay. Um, there were a lot of postal workers in the area. Um, and like I said, a lot of them had their own businesses. Uh, you know, elect they did electrical work, carpenters. It was just a vibrant, neighborhood, and that included Fairmont Heights, Chapel Oaks, Cedar Heights, and the Deanwood communities, you know. Great. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, I just, you know, because that helps to really set a picture, uh, pr pr create a picture, paint a picture for, mm -hmm. for, for what happened. And Mr. Collins, you sort of mentioned that 
And again, I want to I'll start off with Ms. Barnes. Um, uh, could you describe for us the fire that was the impetus for the fire station? And before we go on, I just want everybody to, to remember that you, uh, uh, Ms. Gorham Barnes, are the uh, descendant of one of the founders of the fire station. So um, if you could go into that for us, please. Okay. Um, the um, fire happened on August 23rd, 1946. My... Um, three older siblings were um, at home. They lived in a kind of a row house. There was uh, a family in the front. They were in the back part of the house. And that uh, evening, my aunt was babysitting and it got kind of late. So she left the house to go and get my mom, which was a couple of doors down at the neighbor's house. And she went down there and I guess on their way back, the house was on fire. So um, one of my other aunt's children that were in the house also, they were in the front part of the house in the bedroom. So my aunt Louise Corner was able to get in the house and pull her two children out but my siblings were in the back of the house in the back bedroom. And one of the um, neighbors, Raleigh Jordan saw the fire and he ran over and went around to the back of the house and he could hear the siblings screaming. He said he got to the window and he had one of their hands, but he said someone opened the front door and there was a blowback and he was thrown back to the ground on his back. And by that time he said the house collapsed and, uh -huh. and it was in flames. And, yes. And so that was the impetus. Uh, where where yes. was the fire department at that time, the existing fire department? Um, the, there was a station in Sea Pleasant and there, a call went out to them. And back in that, those days, there was either no response or slow response. So they called the DC Fire Department and they came out because the house was near the DC line, Eastern Avenue, um, Northeast. And, um, the DC Fire Department's equipment, their hoses didn't match the Merlin's um, hose, you know, fire hydrants. Yes. So they had to hook up their hoses on the DC side, run their hoses across uh, Eastern Avenue to the home to put out the fire. And by that time it was too late. Yeah. Mr. Collins. A uh, question for you. You're, you're, you're a firefighter, correct? Retired Reti firefighter? Retired, yes, sir. And, and, and so, and, and, and you're writing a history, actually, on, on, on Black firefighters. Based upon your own knowledge, uh, when, when Ms. Barnes stated that there was no usually a no response, a slow response in certain areas, and, 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 and Ms. Barnes, feel free to chime in. Is this something that has to do with Black communities not responding? Uh, maybe these were with racing issue here. I think that's what I mean. Yeah. Well, I, I'm pretty sure it was. I mean, uh, we look at most fire departments in general in, in the area, D.C., Baltimore, uh, they didn't even hire African-Americans in, the, um, in their departments. So to have a volunteer company uh, may have a decision on whether or not they're even going to show up, because first of all, you got to show up to the firehouse. Right. So to find out, so to make the decision, an individual have a decision to say, oh, am I going to show up to the firehouse to respond down there? Uh, I'm pretty sure race was involved because uh, a lot of times if you don't see yourself, then it doesn't necessarily reflect your, your level of uh, engagement for the service, to provide so the service. 
at that time period, we're talking 1946, this is sort of a general way, 1950s. That's, yes. Okay. And, and, and Ms. Ms. Barnes, I saw you uh, uh, agreeing with him. Is, is there more that you could uh, elaborate on with, with regard to your community specifically and a, and a lack of response, a lack of service? Okay. Um, well, they did not respond to the black community, the white fire departments. Mm -hmm. And also, um, according to some of the ones that uh, the family had talked to, they, um, there was all, you know, there were all white staffs at the Sea Pleasant and Chevrolet Fire Department. I forgot to mention the Chevrolet Fire Department. So, um, They just didn't show. And they I mean, would have been, what, 15 minutes away, maybe, at the most? The, I guess the C. Pleasant Fire Department, yeah, 15 minutes, both Chevrolet and C. Pleasant, yes. Hello, now, could I interject for one second? Yes. Um, this is just going back to the neighborhood where you lived. Um, mm -hmm. Was it called the bottom? The, yes, that was the bottom. Yeah. And, um, and just um, talking about the houses, you mentioned that they were uh, similar to what we would consider row houses today. You mentioned that your father and also Mr. Jordan um, were army vets. They had served in World War II. And yes. so they, come, they came back to the area. And I suppose many people um, may have been able to take advantage of some of those benefits from World War II um, to purchase and build their homes. Um, my understanding is that a lot of the homes were built from uh, very combustible wood. And so that that fire and the enormity of it um, alarmed like the entire neighborhood, like the, it, 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 there was like a big, uh, just shining ball of fire, you know, out there that everybody saw and was greatly alarmed by because that could have it was a tragedy in and of itself, but it could have caught on to the other houses around it because of the materials that they were built with. Right, yeah, back then they called them clapboard houses. Yeah, that was, yeah. They were made from clapboard, yes. And also um, at that time, um, you had mentioned that the uh, district fire department was actually the first to respond versus the uh, Prince George's uh, departments and that their hoses didn't connect. But what was the water situation like in, in that community um, at that time? Was there ready access to running water and indoor plumbing, if you know? Let me see, few of the homes had running water, but yeah. So, yeah, from what I, you know, heard, they, those homes had one running water, but a lot of the homes didn't have running water. Yeah. So a fire in such a condition it would be devastating all around um, yeah. to the families that are going to be impacted, impacted by it um, uh, with the danger that a single fire um, had, but those neighbors in the surrounding uh, community could have been impacted as well um, by such a large um, tragic fire. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing it back to you, Dr. Davis. Hey, not a problem, Dr. Brown, thank you for that. So here we have this, this devastating situation in, in, a, in, a, in a black community and you have a lack of response, a lack of service. So um, I, I'd like to offer this to Mr. Collins. What have you, what are your recollections or knowledge about the actual founding of the uh, fire department after this, after this tragedy? Well, I, I have friends, uh, what, what got me interested in the, how, many, how so many people that have been trained and have gone through the Chapel Oaks Volunteer Fire Department, who have become chiefs of departments, uh, who have become chiefs in all the Northern Virginia, Maryland, and, and D.C., 
departments. And this network or um, uh, brotherhood of Chapel Oak alumni who've gone on to other departments and who proudly said, yeah, I was at Chapel Oaks. And so after hearing about it and finding out that it was still around, and I, it was probably about maybe 10, 15 years ago that I first heard about it. And I actually drove past, I said, oh, this is a new, new file. So I said, no, this isn't where they started. And that's when I started digging into the, the history. So knowing that these people did well from this department, I started asking questions about, because they told me the story about how the Gorm children were, uh, perished in the, in the fire. But I just, out of curiosity, said, well, how old were they? I said, I don't know. I said, well, were they boys, girls, mixed, what? I said, nobody knew. And so that was the, the um, motivation for me to find, the, to, to find out the names of these young people so that anybody who benefited from the experience of this family, the tragedy of this family, they would at least know the names of the, and ages now, of the three children that were killed. Because if you stand on shoulders and you, you just stand and you don't know the shoulders you're standing on, uh, once you know, you might stand a little bit taller. All right, well, Ms. Barnes, thank you, Ms. Barnes. When yes. it comes to the actual founding, though, um, what what it, that what your your father was one of the founders, correct? Yes. So and 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 the as Mr. Collins said, the three uh, uh, children who perished in the fire, they would have been your siblings. Yes. Right. And so, it, it, and you were born after this event. Yes. What what had you heard about the founding of of the department? My understanding is that it was. Mr. Uh, your, 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 your father, Mr. Gorm, uh, uh, Gorm, and I guess will be Chief Gorm, and uh, Mr. Jordan, who was across the street, that actually started pushing to, or started and created the, the department. Yes. Uh, what had you heard, or what are your reflections? Okay. Um, well, I know my dad's motivation for the founding of the fire department. It was to build a fire department in Chapel in the Chapel Oats area to spare others the pain of unnecessary loss that he had suffered. And he was determined not to let another family suffer it like, you know, our family suffered. So uh, it was him and Mr. Jordan and some other um, neighbors that bonded together to get this off of the ground. I thought the chief would be on here. I had a few names of the, um, some of the earlier members, founders. I don't know, should I mention them or? Please. Okay. It was uh, Raleigh Jordan, Luther Crutchfield. Put me on, was, put the what's called up. And it was, um, Langston Fitzgerald Jr. And some of the other ones were Lester Booth Sr. and Jr. And it's... Um, and, and these were all gentlemen from the community? Yes, oh, the, yes. Were they, were, had, do you, to your knowledge, did any of them have any kind of previous training? I'm as not as sure, as sure. As yeah. Sure. And, and Chief Bolden, and I hope he, he uh, maybe he'll chime in a little later. Uh, when does he come, when does he become involved in the department, in the history of the department? Okay, he's a, he's a younger guy. I think he's in his uh, 40s, 47, so. Oh, okay, so he's more yeah. of a recent addition. Yeah, he's, yeah. Okay. I, I um, you know, both Dr. Brown and I had done some some preliminary research on the department, and you know, you we were talking about your community, the community you grew up in, and 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 it seemed like um, like you said, many government employees, nice homes, owned homes, modest homes. But based upon the history that I've read, and Mr. Collins, maybe you can help us out with this. Um, these first. Uh, these founders 
had to come up with funding to purchase or lease a truck and to uh, obtain a, a firehouse. Can either of you elaborate on how that occurred initially? Can I, read, can I read a, a recollection that goes along with what you were asking, Dr. Davidson? Yes, please. Um, it says, um, they were mobilized by their grief to take action to make sure tragedies like the one that took the Gorham children might not happen again. It was a militant notion in 1946, the idea that a neighborhood of working class Negroes would organize a fire department. Blacks had been fighting fires since the days of slavery when they were lined up between wells and burning buildings in bucket brigades. <clears throat> they got no assistance from Prince George's County. So residents from Deanwood Park, Chapel Oaks, Fairmount Heights and Cedar Heights for predominantly black neighborhoods that joined in the effort, pooled their money. Slowly, the fledgling company raised enough to buy a used pumper and began making runs, mostly to the homes of black residents. We weren't in the County Fire Association because they had a white male only clause, said one of the early founders who joined the volunteers in 1949. Thank you. So, is there, um, I was just wondering, with that in mind, um, the first pumper, uh, people pooling their money together, uh, my understanding that they were at, that, that, that the first um, leased property was partially donated by a resident and that that burned down uh, due to a faulty fire alarm. And then later, uh, someone mortgaged their home to purchase land on which to build a, another firehouse. Do you all have any 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 details on that or any recollections? Okay, that was uh, Willie Rodney Jr. He mortgaged his home. I know about him, but it was other folks too that mortgaged their homes, but I don't have their names. Right. But I do remember Mr. Rodney. So this was this was just really a, a grassroots effort here on behalf of African Americans based on the tra terrible tragedy. To, to, to right or wrong in many ways, to set, to set things up. I want to um, continue on with the development of the, of the fire department. Uh, but before then, I'd like to get, Ms. Barnes, you, you knew both, um, you knew both uh, your father, of course, and Mr. Jordan, Roy Jordan, personally, am I correct? Yes, yes. Can you give me, I mean, when you hear about dynamic individuals and those people who put together something of this nature, uh, you want to know what they're like. And, and so from someone who knew firsthand who they were, what they were like, could you give me some, some sort of a, a description maybe, or you know, tell me a little something about both individuals? Because it takes a lot of commitment and dedication. Okay. Well, my dad was a, he was always positive, he was a purposeful person and he saw the bigger picture and he addressed the needs rather than complain. He never complained. He just did what he had to do, you know, to get things going. And Roy Jordan, he was my dad's best friend. So he was motivated to do anything he could to, um, get it going. He was a very positive person. Um, you know, I grew up with his children, his younger children, and we spent a lot of time together, but always positive. I mean, just strong black men that, you know, had a purpose. I'm and sure hardworking as well. Yes, they were hardworking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, so keeping that in mind, and looking at uh, the department in the early years, we were talking about how they obtained equipment in the firehouse uh, through, you know, people sacrificing, you know, mortgaging their own homes. Um, but what about training? And and I don't know if if that is Chief Bolden who has joined us. Uh, it is. <laughs> and can I just um. Uh another recollection that goes along with what you're saying. And then I also wanted to alert you to the fact that Chief Bolden has joined us. Um, let me just, uh, so this is another recollection. Um, 
Despite the attempts to exclude them, the black firefighters often arrived before the dispatch units having been called by the residents themselves. When they got a call, the volunteer on duty at the station sounded a house siren whose blast could be heard six miles away. If we were first on the scene, we would take care of business. The white firefighters would want to, co would want to come out, take our lines out and put theirs in. They wouldn't recognize the authority of our, of our chief on the scene, but we wouldn't play those games. We were professional men who were there to save lives and that's what we did. They were a motley crew in those early days. Most of the volunteers didn't have helmets, coats, or boots. They held their breath or tied wet, wet kerchiefs over their faces to keep from inhaling smoke, eventually acquiring discards such as coats, boots, and helmets from the military. The firefighters trained themselves, setting fires and putting them out in old abandoned buildings. Thank you, thank you. So, with that in mind, and I think that sort of uh, plays to the a question I have with regard to to training. But looking at this, and you know, seeing that people had to make those sacrifices, that they had to scrimp, save, and sort of uh, ask for donations. Um, how many? What were the numbers like that you remember, or that any of you have access to? And welcome, Chief Bolden. Thank you for for joining us. Uh, what were the numbers? Uh, as far as the volunteers at any given period, were there 10 in the department or 20, 30? Hmm. He's muted. Uh, you, Chief Baldwin, you're muted. Let me see if I can. All right. How about now? You're good. I can hear, we can hear you. So I joined the department uh, so. I think we're going to have to work on his connection um, yes. for a second. Um, we're having told. trouble hearing you. We're having and trouble hearing you, Chief Golden. You came with a lot of members. There the it 60s is. and 70s was very seen. Okay. okay. How about that? Yes, that's now. good. <laughs> okay, good. Good. So, so from what I'm being told is that our membership in the 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, 80s, we've always had at least about 10 to 15 people. Membership did decline in the mid-90s, and then it also increased again in the late 90s to the 2000s. Okay. So right now, our member. Our membership now, our membership now is low. Uh, we roller coaster. COVID isn't helping. So right now, our membership is down to about maybe fifteen to twenty. Okay. Well, I'm glad to say, it. and most are most of these volunteers over time are most of them from the community. Uh, based upon some now nowadays they are, um, but then you have some some people like I'll take one guy, Chris Adams. Um, he was from North Carolina. Uh, he graduated from Howard, um, but he didn't have nowhere to stay. Uh, he couldn't get a dorm. So he heard of the fire department to be a volunteer, and then he can live at the firehouse. So he moved into the firehouse and became a volunteer member. And uh, he eventually graduated from Howard. He actually owns an Amazon now in, um, in New Jersey. Oh, that's great. So, yeah, so it's it's. it's, it's a whole bunch of other stories uh, useful that the firehouse uh, was able to come and play for. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's funny because I was, in doing some of the research and looking around, because I had not a chance to really get deep into it, I ran across a Dr. Anthony Barnes. Ms. Barnes, is that your? That's my son. Your son. And mm -hmm. he um, it's awesome because he said that when he was younger, he would come to the firehouse and, and hang out with his grandfather. And the one thing that impressed him was how uh, Chief Gorham would uh, tell people, you can come, you can volunteer, as long as you continue your education. You can right. hang out with us, but you have to continue. And Mr. Collins, you mentioned not just the education, but how well-trained uh, individuals were, the experiences that they had that allowed them then to move on into higher positions uh, within uh, fire departments throughout Maryland. 
Uh, so and Northern Virginia, Northern Virginia benefits Northern, a lot in DC. Oh, great, great. Well, thank you, thank you, Chief Bowen. That sort of brings me to some other issues, and I want I'm going to have to move quickly because I keep I keep getting my eye off of the time. But I, I'm I'm interested going back to something that Doctor. Uh, Brown had mentioned with regard to white firefighters coming on the scene, um, not respecting the authority of black firefighters who had gotten there first of disconnecting their hoses. I read something somewhere that not only were they doing that, at times they would hold black firefighters down uh, so their oxygen would run out. Have you, have you all heard anything about this? Or, you know, they were, you know, calling names and, and spitting and that sort of thing. Uh, and this ties into an issue with funding and there was a, a lawsuit filed in 1971. Can any of you elaborate on any of that? Um, I, I can pick up on some of it. Um, and it's, it's all true. I mean, our community of uh, Fairmont Heights Chapel Oaks, which is a black community, when we would go to other communities, uh, such as C. Pleasant at that time was white, if there was a call for a house fire where they would say, they are rather for their house to burn down, put the fire out. Wow. Uh, those, those stories are true. Um, and many a times where it would be fires throughout the county and they purposely wouldn't dispatch Chapel Oaks. Just that, went on, that went on for a very long time. And I also saw something with regard when Chap Lokes was having financial difficulties, uh, needing a new pumper, two pumpers down, trying to get some kind of emergency funding from the county. And we're talking about the 70s. I'm, I'm a native Washingtonian. I was born in Northwest DC. Uh, used to hang out in Montgomery County. But in the 70s, I was afraid to come to Prince George's County uh, because of stories that I heard with regard to not only police brutality, but going into the wrong area where uh, blacks weren't welcome. So in, in, in 1970, I believe it was in March of 71, uh, Chapel Oaks is looking to get help. One truck is down, the other truck is having problems, and they need funding. And the funding's being held up by the county commissioner, mm -hmm. uh, based upon what it, and, and, and so the chief files suit. Mm -hmm. And at this point, the commissioner says, well, I'll give you the funding if you don't uh, if you if you drop the suit and he refuses because they need more money they need a new house, I mean, excuse me a new firehouse because understand that that one was getting older new equipment, and other volunteer companies were being funded from what I understand, what and, and and stuff is being approved. And actually, from the article, it stated that there were white firefighters who supported the funding of Chap Lokes by seventy one. However, there was a larger structure do you, of, of discrimination. Are you familiar with, are any of you familiar with that? So that's true. Um, we had, when we couldn't get things from other stations, the station that actually stepped up and helped Chapel Oaks during that time was Cottage City. Uh, Cottage City was a volunteer fire department and that volunteer fire department, they sold Chapel Oaks one of their fire trucks at a very, very reasonable rate. Mm -hmm. Well, that's good. I'm, I'm glad they did. And, and, my, and, and also based upon what was printed in the post at the time, uh, that there was support from another department, but also that um, the county executive finally relented. But this all goes to highlight, I mean, from its founding in the late 40s up to the 70s, we have a fire department, an all black fire department dedicated to saving lives volunteers who are putting not only their own lives but their fortunes online only to face discrimination but they continue on and i'm sure the community was grateful outside of fighting fires though what was the what was the station's role in this community i have seen pictures of like parades and that sort of thing uh were there like uh food drives clothing drives dances the use of the firehouse as a meeting hall is. Oh, so the firehouse would be more of a firehouse, laundry mat, daycare, car wash, uh, hangout. At nighttime, the firehouse would turn in, go from firehouse to clubhouse, 
So let me elaborate on both. So during the daytime, especially on Saturdays, all the volunteers, they would come to the firehouse to use the wash and dryer. So instead of going to the laundromat to pay, you come to the firehouse and you wash for free. So while you're there washing clothes all day, you're running calls as well. Wow. Then so while you're out on the call, then somebody else will put your clothes in the dryer or you may lose your turn. That'll start a good internal argument in the firehouse. And at Clubhouse, the Clubhouse was at nighttime, we would rent the firehouse out for cabarets. We either go from 10 to 2 or 11 to 3. Well, if you go from 10 to 2, you got to pay extra $75 for the extra hour. Uh, that went on until about maybe 2000, maybe 2010. That was when we actually stopped um, having, allowing cabarets uh, to the files to raise money. We did raise quite a bit of money during those times, so that was help. Uh, double days, during the daytime on Saturdays, we would have wedding receptions. At nighttime, we would have a uh, cabaret. And we would always have members around during these events because the firehouse was getting some money as well. So the members who would set the hall up, they would get, get paid like $25 cash. So you would actually have members who was uh, saying they're going to set up for both so they could at least walk away with $50 <laughs> uh, <laughs> that night. So... So that was a good deal. So when it came time, and if you're there to set the hall up and break the hall down and clean up when we're done, that's good because then we also knew that people was going to be around running calls as well. Well, Ms. Barnes, do you recollect anything, any recollections as well? Yes. Um, I guess in the, they would have carnivals uh, at least twice a year and people would come around from everywhere to come to the carnivals. And also the ladies auxiliary would sell dinners on the weekend. Mm. So I remember Saturdays upon Saturdays um, up at the firehouse, my mom was part of the ladies auxiliary and they would cook and sell dinners um, to raise money. But I know the carnival was a big fundraiser because everybody loved the carnival back then. <laughs> yeah. I heard, I heard the carnivals. They, they were. That was a little bit before my time. <laughs> but I, I've seen a few pictures of the carnival, and you know, a, a few things that we still that was still going on. We would still do flea markets. Um, a few people who would want to come out and cook ribs, ribs and chicken in front of the firehouse. Um, we would just charge them like two hundred dollars. So it sounds like it's still a center of, 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 of community activity in some way, that the community is actually connected to the firehouse. Uh, I tell you, very much so. And that's just of uh, well, COVID times now. But we would have a repass at the firehouse at least once a week, if I was to average it out. Wow. So everyone in the community know they can go to the firehouse, have a repass. And the way we do that is... We charge for repass, but we don't charge. And what I mean by that, when, when individuals ask how much for a repass, we say we'll take a donation of 250 And we know as some repass, they got to pass the hat. And sometimes the hat be more than 250 and sometimes the hat be 50 <laughs> but, <laughs> but whatever was in the hat, that's what it was because the firehouse has always been a community firehouse and we didn't want to turn the community down by saying oh your parents your grandparents lived in this area forever uh you don't have 250 dollars, so you can't have a repass no That's no awesome. we say you can have your repass at the firehouse um any donation it's fine and the firefighters they like it too because half the time it's a repass you get lunch and dinner free <laughs> <laughs> while you're doing your clothes right on the set <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty good though. I, I mean, you know, this is this is awesome, really awesome. I don't want to, you know, uh, go past the time allotted us. So, I want to move to sort of wrapping things up by asking the question: What do you see as the legacy? The legacy 
of Chapel Oaks uh, Fire Department. You know, what, 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 what is that legacy? What has it provided for the community? What, what is the legacy to, to firefighters, Mr. Collins, to the community chief Bolden and Ms. Barnes? What is that legacy? If you could put in a few words, each one of them. Well, I'll go first. Yes, Ms. Barnes, thank you. Okay, my dad left behind a legacy of carriage and a story of triumph over tragedy. And yeah. Thank you, yes, that's beautiful. Uh, well, Mr. Collins. Well, the African American Firefighters Historical Society at our annual salute dinner, we were able to um, recognize the three grown children, Jean, uh, Ruth, and Leroy Jr. And I use the phrase that's very familiar uh, to the black community, and I've only used it for them. And I think the legacy of the Chapel Oaks Volunteer Fire Department goes to Jean, Ruth, and Leroy. The question we all should ask ourselves, what did you do with your dash? Wow. And that dash is that space between your birthday and your death day. And even though those years between them and the Leroy Jr. who didn't even have a full year, uh, uh, that they've done more in their dash than most people put together will ever do. And that's what I'll always see as the legacy of the Chapel Oaks Volunteer Fire Department. Chief Holden. You know, we've had some, the Chapel Oaks Volunteer Fire Department have saved many people. Um, I can say myself, for example, when when I was 16 years old, um, instead of running the street with my friends, so on, I joined the fire department. I just wanted to be in the fire department all the time. And I enjoyed it. I, I learned a lot. I ate, I ate good. Uh, <laughs> but the, the, leg the legacy behind the firehouse is is that it's a safe place and for our community it was able to save a lot of people's lives. We have, we have members that has come through Chapel Oaks Fire Department that have moved on to be fire chiefs in other departments throughout, secret service agents, lawyers, doctors, uh, law enforcement. We have a background, Chapel Oaks is well known for producing successful individuals. And not only that, the individuals that want to get involved in the fire department and to get a job, we're, we're it. We're here to groom that person next level. And that's our community give back. The legacy, it taught us community give back. And that's, and that's what we still provide today. Wow, every awesome. new member that come through, every new member that come through Chapel Oaks that want to move on in public safety, my job is to make sure they move on the correct way. So, and, and real quick, such as even down to having to take a member to get their driver's license. Oh, goodness. Um, but, these, but these are things that are needed to get jobs in public safety. If you don't have a valid driver's license, you can't, you can't get hired. So it starts there, preparing, preparing for those baby steps so we can help you in the future. We did a class um, a few years ago where we had a large community outcome, um, large community show up, and we showed them how to apply to the Anne Arundel County Fire Department step by step by step. And in return, what we did was we had a police officer come in, he brought his laptop and he ran everybody name. A few of them had suspended driver's license. Six of them had open warrants that they, that they so-called didn't know about. So they didn't get locked up that night, but it was, <laughs> it was like, hey, go get this. But if they apply for these jobs and they go in there with this driver's license suspended, got open warrant, they automatically get disqualified. And this is why Blacks cannot give in these departments. Well, it seems that we may have, oh, well, thank you. Thank you. you we, we lost you for a quick second. That is, 
listening to all this is, is awesome. I hope you all don't mind. We, we have a question uh, from, from a student. Right. Um, we have a, a few questions and some comments. Um, and then I have a question too. Um, so one of the com uh, one of the questions um, was that if um, a neighborhood um, experienced a devastating fire like that, what would happen to the people? They're wondering if um, they would have been left homeless or if others would have stepped up to give them shelter. Okay, in my family's situation, my grandmother lived uh, in the area, so they moved in with, you know, my grandmother. Yeah, and stayed there until they were able to get back on their feet. Yeah. Thank you. And then um, we have, um, I think, some people from the neighborhood. Um, one is saying that they remember the carnivals that you all were speaking about. <laughs> um, we have another comment that this was phenomenal information and stories. Um, and then um, another question about the historic nature of Chapel Oaks altogether. How common um, is it to find um, an African-American volunteer fire department like Chapel Oaks, not only in the state of Maryland, but if you know nationwide? Well, I, we I, can, I can speak nationwide. It, it was very common back in the day, but for them to last as long as Chapel Oaks has, that's another that's another question. Jonathan, you got anything to add to that? Yeah, it's not many. Um, there was one in South Carolina called um, Promised Land. That's an all black uh, volunteer fire department right outside of uh, Greenwood, South Carolina. Then in Delaware, there's one that's still Belvedere. in existence. Belvedere. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. Belvedere Fire Department. And so for a few years, Chapel Oaks would always travel to Belvedere for their annual uh, Christmas banquet. And what we found out was back in the day in the early 60s, Chapel Oaks also used to go to Belvedere for their annual parade. So basically to answer your question, we know of three, one in Delaware, Chapel Oaks, and one in South Carolina. Thank you. Okay, and uh, the other people are talking about that they get they got a lot of information and they found the program very interesting. <laughs> Great. Well, I want to thank you all for coming on today. This was this was awesome. Um, like you say, I, I uh, Dr. Brown and I both teach African American history. We both. Well, I'm not going to say how long she's been teaching, but I've been teaching for uh, this. This will be my 22nd year. And to run into, you know, this history, this rich history, and also how it's linked to the sacrifice, your family sacrifice, Ms. Barnes, and the sacrifice you talk of, Mr. Collins, and to see the continued sacrifice of people like yourself, Mr. Collins, and, and Chief Bolden, who have put your lives on the line for not just your own communities, but maybe for communities who don't expect someone like you to show up. Or when you do show up and you take your helmet off and they get to see who you are, they wouldn't have sat beside you on the bus or, uh, or wanted to have a, a meal with you. But this is an awesome legacy and it's an inspiring story. One built from tragedy. But like I started off in the beginning, when denied access, African-Americans have always found a way to build their own. They didn't beg or ask, they moved. So I thank you all for your sacrifice, and I thank you for the history. Okay. I want to take the time to thank Bowie State University for this uh, opportunity to partner with you. Uh, being a historically black university, uh, the, uh, the fact that people say what HBCU should do, it's good to see you doing it and doing it in the community in which you are. Uh, uh, a house. So that, that in itself speaks to the Bowie State legacy as well. Thank you, Thank you so much. We look forward to continuing to chronicle this very important history um, of the community and of Chapel Oaks in particular. Um, we're just so excited to be on board with this project with all of you. And we look forward to the anniversary this summer. Thank you all so much.
Okay, thank right. you. One, one quick thing to say, and uh, Tanya, you was involved in this also. Back in 2004, uh, Chapel Oaks received a FEMA grant uh, um, from FEMA, and we purchased a $500,000 fire truck, and FEMA gave us about maybe 420000 of that. When we applied for our grant and we wrote our grant, the grant writing team was from Bowie State University. Oh, they, right. they, they, <laughs> they wrote the grant for us for a homework assignment or some type of assignment. So basically they didn't go to school for about maybe two or three weeks. Instead of going to school, they came to the firehouse. Um, the two, and there was two, two young ladies, uh, Nicole and Lori, and they hung out in the firehouse in the evening. So they got to go on calls. They got to eat good. And they learned, they, they basically, the stuff we went over, they basically learned the firehouse. They got to see the operations. So they wrote out grant for us. And at that time in 2004, 2005, Chapel Oaks received the highest amount of money from FEMA for one single piece of apparatus that we still use to this day. Oh, my goodness. Wonderful. Wonderful. What a good connection. Well, yes. I'm definitely going to be driving past. Um, I know there's a monument there to uh, the Gorham children, I believe, or to uh, firefighters. It's to the, so the, the, the monument is actually at the old firehouse, okay. which is 5312 Sheriff Road. Park and Planning did that for us okay. back in 91, 92, somewhere in there. So the Chapel Oaks Volunteer Fire Department still own the facility. We rent it out to a church. Well, I'm glad to know. And that's 5312 Sheriff Road. I, I always ask students and, and other historians and other history enthusiasts to, to go and search the landscape for memorials. So thank you. And I know I'll be coming by to uh, either wave and say hello to some of the firefighters there at the new facility. Dr. Brown. Thank you. Good. <laughs> We still here? We there? Are we? 